Welcome to the Three Championship Drive podcast on YouTube, hosted by me, Lance Caparossi. Follow me on X at Lance Caparossi, the same way you see it spelled on the screen. And check out the Three Championship Drive podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Do me a favor, tell a Pistons fan. All right, we got a lot to talk about on this podcast, and we're going to get into it. First things first, though, we all see the videos and images of Devin Booker rocking Detroit gear from Tigers to Red Wings to Lions jerseys. He's talked about the going to work squad as a team he watched and looked up to as a kid. He dreamed of playing for the Detroit Pistons. Like he's always teasing us fans of, you know, it seems like there's just always that moment he might just say, Hey, I want to come, I want to come home and I want to play for the team. It always seems like we're getting that from him with just these little teases of him wearing the jersey. Now, Stan Van Gundy had a chance to draft Devin Booker back in the 2015 NBA draft, but instead the Pistons went with Stanley Johnson. They needed more defense on that wing position because remember the Eastern Conference, it was ran through the Cleveland Cavaliers. You needed to have any chance you had to win in the Eastern Conference, you needed a guy that was quote unquote a LeBron stopper. And at the time, Stanley Johnson coming out of Arizona, you know, big beefy guy, kind of looked like a young Ron Artest. Pistons felt like, you know, this might be our best chance to have a LeBron stopper on the roster. And really, if you go back and check out some of those pre draft articles, I don't think very many guys had Devin Booker going in the top 10. So, even now looking at it, it does suck because he was right there. And who wouldn't want to draft the hometown kid out of Grand Rapids to your team that looked up to this franchise? But it really wasn't, you know, I mean, at the time, it wasn't really talked about him being there. So I don't blame the Pistons. It does suck looking back on it because, again, he was right there. But I understand why you're going after Stanley Johnson. And, you know, Again, it does hurt a little bit after we've seen the heights that Devin Booker has reached and Stanley Johnson has kind of just bounced around and right out of the league. So I get why fans are so upset about not drafting Devin Booker. But let's be honest, the Donovan Mitchell draft, that was a little bit more heartbreaking because he was right there and we had all heard how great his workout was for the Pistons. Now, I'm not going to try to lose and go off topic, so let's get back into this. I reposted a video of Devin Booker wearing a Steve Iserman jersey with the comment, what could have been? And then someone on my Twitter, one of my Twitter followers, asked if I would trade Kane Cunningham in a salary filler for Devin Booker this offseason. I think it's a great question, and man, I don't think a lot of people are going to like where this is going. But it is, again, it is a great question. And my immediate answer was, I want to see Cade and Jaden Ivy together for another year and then decide between the two. I think it's fair. I think it's a fair answer. A backcourt of Cade and Devin Booker would be absolutely insane. Like, it would be crazy. You got two six-foot-six guy, six six guys that can operate in the mid-range, score from all three levels, and play make for others. That would just be insanity in Detroit. And then a backcourt of Jaden Ivey and Devin Booker, that would be filthy. I mean, you got a, you got one of the best two guards in the league, and then you got one of the best athletes whose speed was compared to Allen Iverson during the Rising Stars game. That would just be a filthy backcourt. So Devin Booker this year is averaging 27.5, 4.6 rebounds, and 7 assists on 50-37 in 87 shooting splits. He's averaged 25 or more for seven years straight. Two years ago, he was fourth in MVP voting and made all NBA first team. Now we've seen now we've seen Cade put up these same numbers, but it was only for a 10-game stretch where he was averaging 28.7, four rebounds, eight assists, shooting 53% from the field, 37% from three, and 85% from the free throw line. It was an incredible 10 games. And then unfortunately, he went down with that injury against the Denver Nuggets. So I wouldn't blame anybody for wanting to trade Cade for Devin Booker because, again, I think that's more than fair, and I think the Pistons would be coming out way better than the Phoenix Suns if that trade was to go 
down. And again, it's not because I think Kate is a bad player. I want to make that very clear. I do lean to making that trade because Devin Booker has just been such a good player in the NBA for such a long time. I mean, like I said earlier, seven straight seasons of 25 or more points per game. He is one of the best two guards. He got Kobe Bryant's blessing of go and be great. You know, so again, I don't blame anybody. I lean towards making the trade. And the other reason I lean towards making that trade is, again, I don't believe in the front office to build a contender around Cade and the health issues. Those are the big ones for me. Now, I know Devin Booker, he has had his own health issues as well. But when I look back at his numbers, he's a guy that's, you know, playing 65 or more games or around there during that seven-year stretch. Now, I know he's had a few seasons where he had under that, but still, he's played, you know, majority of the season. As long as he's giving me 65 to 70 games, I'm okay with that. The jury's still out on Cade Cunningham, whether he can do that. His health is more of a concern for me than anything Devin Booker is dealing with right now or has dealt with in the past. I'm just being realistic. But again, you know, you see the potential of Cade. And it's just like, ah, dude, do you really want to trade him before he hits his peak when you do have Devin Booker again putting up those numbers for seven straight seasons, being fourth in MVP voting, but how much better is Devin Booker going to get, even though he has been part of an NBA Finals team? It's just, you know, do you take the guy who's hasn't reached the ceiling yet, or do you take the guy that's in his peak right now? I think it's a fair question. I think it's an interesting question, and I'm okay. I would love to hear everybody else's thoughts on this question. So, like I said, and I'm going to end it with this, I do lean towards trading Cade for Devin Booker. I want to see the hometown kid in Detroit. I would rather see a backcourt of Cade, Devin Booker, and even Jaden Ivey. Like, I mean, if you could get those three on the team, it would just be just crazy. I guess the other thing I'm thinking about now too is if you did trade Cade for Devin Booker, how much better would the Pistons be? And with this roster with Monty Williams, with the uncertainty of, you know, Troy Weaver being able to actually build a competitive team, I don't know how much better the Pistons would be with Devin Booker. Would they be I think with him on the team, a guy that can control the pace, can score from all three levels, has won in this league. He's one of the better two guards. I mean, he's going to get a whistle when he drives to the rim. I think you would, I think he would, he would make the team better. He would raise the floor of this team, but I still think even with Devin Booker on this roster right now, the Pistons would be, they'd still be a losing franchise. I'm not, I don't think they would be a playoff team. I don't think they would be a playing team, but I do think they would have more than eight wins right now on the season with Devin Booker if it was Cade Cunningham. I just There's just something about Devin Booker and his presence where I think he would will at least a few more wins for this team, especially the close ones. He would give us a closer. But then again, with Monty, you never know because his lineups are just absolutely insane and his rotations just make me sick. And they make no sense. And they haven't all season. Before the Lakers game, Monty Williams said it was unrealistic for him to play 11 to 12 guys. He played 10 in the first quarter. I know there's a bunch of new faces in Detroit, but in, instead of playing so many guys in one game, like, I mean, I think in the Lakers game, we saw all 12 players on the roster play. The only guy we didn't see was Tawson. Just stick with the 10-man rotation. Talk to the bench guys. Look at Shake Millen. Look at Evan Fournier and say, hey, one of you guys isn't going to play. It just, I, I need to try to figure this out. Do something and just stick with that and then just play different guys depending on the game. I don't know how any of these guys get into a rhythm. I mean, against the Lakers game, I believe Evan Fournier played the most minutes even over the starters or was playing starters minutes off the bench. It's just, even though you guys know I love Evan Fournier, I just think that's kind of insane for a coach to do that is still trying to win games in Detroit, regardless of standings, you know, you still need to win. And these rotations, they just don't help. 
I'm still surprised that we're seeing James Wiseman because everybody in the world knows this guy doesn't have it, but we have a coach that has decided that this is the new Killian Hayes and I got to try to fix him. I got to try to see if I can crack that potential. The thing about James Wiseman that is super glaring when you're watching him, it's just the way he processes the game. It doesn't make sense. Like he doesn't really have the instincts. Like when he gets the ball, it's like a second or two before he decides to do with it versus you know, a guy that can get the ball and just instantly make a move. James Wiseman doesn't have that in his game. He's just too slow to react. And I don't know why, because he's been playing basketball his entire life. And I think that's the biggest thing that holds him back is he just is not adjusted to the NBA game. He still plays at a much slower level than he needs to be. Even though he did have a good game against the Lakers, it was just, you know, I mean, throughout that's just one good game. If you've watched him all throughout the season, you can see this guy, he just hasn't made the right adjustments to be a quality NBA player. Now we have Mike Muscala on the roster, and when he's on the floor, he's he's damn near been a plus player every time he's played for the Pistons. He makes more sense with the personnel we have on this roster. Seems to be a pretty good communicator defensively. I mean, he's not going to lead the league in blocks. He's probably not even going to lead this team in blocks, but he knows where to be. He has active fans. He goes straight up when he's contesting shots. He's not shooting the greatest percentage from three. I believe it's around 32% this season, even though that's his elite skill. It's just he pulls defenders away from the rim. He creates space, and guys, when they're on the floor with him, look much better just because he does allow that room for an Asar, for a Cade, for a Jaden Ivey, for a Marcus Sasser, for a Duran, even when he shares the floor with him, to have room in the paint near the rim to do their things. And I just don't understand why his butt is glued to the bench, you know, under Monty Williams and why we're seeing – you know, 20 plus minutes from James Wiseman. It's just, it's insanity. We need to stop seeing Asar and Dern together because it just isn't working. Both those guys right now in their careers, they need the paint to be open. And when they're both there, it just, it clogs too many things. There's too many defenders. I've seen Dern get blocked too many times in the last two games against the Lakers and the Phoenix Suns. It was just, I mean, it's something you don't see. Like, he's 20 years old. He jumps over everybody. And then Asar, it's just the offense game isn't there. He plays better when Mascala is out on the floor with him. I would rather see him, even though it pains me, I would rather see Asar come off the bench and play with Mike Mascala and operate in the paint near the rim where he has been effective. He just hasn't been as effective with Duran on the floor. We need to see Troy Brown Jr. He's a keeper, and he should be a guy going forward that continues to receive a bulk of minutes at the 3-4 spot. Again, another communicator defensively, strong weak side rebounder, can hit an outside shot, everything hustles after loose balls. This is just a guy that you have him on your roster. Your team is that much better. He needs to be getting the minutes. I would actually rather see him start with Simone Fontecchio and Cade and Jaden Ivey and Dern, I think that could potentially be the best five-man lineup you could put out on the floor. And it would still allow you to give minutes to Asar at the four spot, backing up Troy Brown Jr. and Mike Muscala at the five. I think that would I think that's the move you go with. He doesn't provide a ton of offense, but it's just all the little things he does that you need from a player to eventually start winning games. I love Troy Brown Jr. I know fans hate Evan Fournier, but the Pistons do need a guy off the bench who can create a shot, and he gives the Pistons just that. I do disagree with Monty Williams playing him 25-plus minutes a night. I know he has Russ to work off of, but I thought this was a guy that would probably play like 18 or 19 around there, maybe even a little bit less. I have been a fan of Evan Fournier, and I do think he's still a walking bucket and can be very serviceable for the Pistons. But right now, when you have so many young guys while you're losing so many games, to you know, maybe not to lose the fan base, maybe have Fournier sit a little bit. Maybe if Sasser's struggling, maybe then you play Fournier. I just don't know how you're going to fix it. It seems like there's way too many players on this team, and Monty is clueless to what rotations he wants to play with but we do know 
he loves having a veteran like Evan Fournier who's been in the league for a while, can go out and get you a bucket. He loves giving those guys minutes, and I still think we're going to see it for Evan Fournier. I'm not losing hope, though. I still think he's he's going to be a bucket for the Pistons the rest of the season. So Woodward Sports, they asked an interesting question, and they asked, would you still draft Cade Cunningham in a 2021 redraft? And the short answer is yes, because I don't know why anybody would pass on Cade Cunningham. I do think they meant to ask if fans would still want to draft Cade with the first pick in a 2021 redraft, and the answer is still yes. I do love this draft class, and I want to make it very clear. I'm not trying to be disrespectful to a single player that I'm about to talk to talk about, but this draft, it was full of future All-Stars, but I don't think any one of these guys, Cade including, has earned the title yet of de facto franchise player. I think a bunch of these guys that I'm about to talk to are franchise cornerstones, but when I think of a franchise player, I think of a guy that is, like, without a doubt, the number one option. Everything runs through him. The team that the team identity is built around their identity. Every offseason move, every trade, every draft – is designed to get the most out of that player's abilities. That's what I think a franchise player is, and that's why I don't think there is. There, one, at least one, there's a couple of guys that have shown where, you know, I mean, they've shown flashes of having the teams built around them, but there's still, in my opinion, not one single guy from this draft where you can say he is, without a doubt, a franchise player. But we'll get into it. Let's talk about these guys. Scotty Barnes, he has looked very good. So, and then by the way, when I'm talking about this, I'm still taking K number one, but I'm kind of making a case for these other guys, like why I would have potential, why I would consider drafting them over K, but also I'm making a case for why I don't think anybody is a franchise player and it will all make sense at the end. But with Scotty Barnes, he has looked very good in his third year, becoming the first player from his class to make an all-star team, but the Raptors have struggled since they gave Scotty the keys. His best role is probably as a high-end second option, which I like to consider a franchise cornerstone because he can do everything super well. I mean, he can score, he can rebound, he can pass. He's starting to develop a three-point shot where he's taking five of them a game and I think shooting roughly 35%, which is much higher than what he was shooting last season. He has looked the part in some games this season as a franchise player. But again, I think his ceiling is as a number two, you know, I'll take, I'll give you the keys and I'll do everything else, but I'm still on on any given night. I can go off for like 35 plus Evan Mobley, very good defensively. He made the NBA's all defensive first team in his second year. And I believe he was third in defensive player of the year voting. The question remains on him is, Can he carry a team offensively? And that is why I think he isn't a franchise player. I think he can be, again, another franchise cornerstone and a guy that can be in the middle of your defense where you could potentially build the defense around his skill set. But again, it's just, you know, if you didn't have Donovan Mitchell, if you didn't have Darius Garland, if, you know, how good would he be? Would the Cavaliers still be the same team without those guys? I mean, honestly, the answer is no. But if you had to give Evan Mobley more of an offensive responsibility, would he still be as as efficient and effective? And I think we've seen it, and the answer is no, but he's still a very good player. And if the Pistons had gone with him with the number one overall pick, I would not have been disappointed in at all. I thought Evan Mobley coming out was just incredible. Now, Franz Wagner, Franz Wagner, who I believe would go in the top three, Honestly, probably even maybe I think you can make a case for him being the number two player in this draft. And I think you can even make a case for him being why you would take him number one overall. He's a guy who can carry a team offensively night to night. He can play both ways at a high level. He's developing into a three level score, still struggles from the three point line, but he can get to the rim. He can shoot mid range jumpers. He can create for others. His playmaking isn't as 
good as like a Scotty Barnes or a Cade Cunningham, but he can definitely create plays for other players. But he's still not a franchise player. Even Magic fans say his ceiling is probably as a second or third option behind Paolo. I love what the Magic have done building around those two, but it's Paolo's team, Franz Wagner. He's the Swiss Army knife. He's the utility tool. He does everything else at a very high level, but still not a franchise player. And then there's Shane Goon. He's the last guy I'm going to talk about. He has, out of all these guys, probably has the most issues defensively, but he has taken a step in being a better defensive player. But offensively, he's the complete package. Now, unless you're talking about three-point lines where he's shooting like around 29%, but he's good on the block. He's good in the in-between areas. He can play make. But again, there are still questions that surround him. Like, can you build an entire offense? Like, can he be your identity for the team? Again, I think he's a franchise cornerstone. It's just, I don't know if he's the guy that is the de facto number one franchise player. And I don't think there was one in this draft. But I think the reason I the reason I would take Cade Cunningham number one overall in the 2021 redraft is, one, I'm a Pistons fan and I'm biased. And I just want to talk him up. But more realistically, I want to, I've seen the flashes just like everybody has. We've seen how good. We've seen him put this team on his back in closeout games. I remember when he did it his rookie year against the Cavaliers where he went 0 for 10 in the first half, and I believe he finished with a triple-double and the win. We've seen moments like that, and we've seen guys with his same archetype where, yeah, you know, I mean, if he can put it all together and he can reach that ceiling as the number one player, you really could – see the team being built around him. Now, I've heard on other podcasts that are way better than mine talk about Cade Cunningham being a high-end second or third option. I'm not going to argue that. I think that's fair. And I think that is, you know, I, I really think that's probably the future we're going for with Cade Cunningham. But out of all of these guys, I would still take him number one because I think the ceiling for him to be a franchise player where you put where every offseason move, every draft, every trade you make is designed to help him maximize his talents. I still think that is out there, and I still think we could live in a world where that is entirely possible. So during the ri Rising Stars game, or the Panini Rising Stars game, an exchange of words happened between Jaden, Ivy, and Benedict Matherin. Matherin told Ivy, you can't guard me even in the Rising Stars game. It seemed like it was all fun, but Jaden Ivy got real intense after this exchange. And I don't know if it was like cat got the tongue or whatever, but he had that look in his eyes where he's like, oh, dude, I just want to, I want this game. I want to be the guy that leads this team back. And I, I don't think I've ever seen that intense look on Jaden Ivy's face. And maybe he just didn't want to get punked. I have no idea. But man, it was it was real intense. So we all know what happened on draft night. Jaden Ivey went fifth to Detroit. Benedict Matherin went sixth to Indiana. At the time of the draft, I really liked Matherin and saw a clear role for him on the Pistons as Cade's sidekick. And to be fair, and to be fair, he came into the NBA as a more polished player than Jaden Ivey. But his ceiling was a little lower. So I understand why the Pistons drafted Jaden Ivey. And I wouldn't change a thing. By the way, I'm taking what Jaden Ivey brings to the floor every single night. I'm taking that over Benedict Matherin. But with Benedict Matherin's size, his defense, you know, I mean, you could really see like, okay, this guy can be a really good third option and a really solid second option next to Cade Cunningham. And I, I really did love his game. I hope this does become an all-out rivalry between these two where every time they meet, they decide to go at each other's throats. That is, I just, I think the NBA is missing that. And we have a real chance to have that with Jaden Ivey and Benedict Matherin. And it would just be, God, it would just be incredible to see the Pistons and the Pacers really have a meaningful rivalry again, like it was back in the early 2000s when the going to work squad was going against Jermaine O'Neal, Steven Jackson, Ron Artest, and the late. Well, I say late because he was later in his career, Reggie Miller, and then Jamal Tinsley. Like, I love that squad, and I love these two when those two teams met. Yeah, there are some fans that probably thought it was a little boring because those games were so low scoring. But, man, those two teams hated each other, and it was just all out every time they met. I loved it. Speaking of the going-to-work squad, Chauncey Billups is a finalist for the Basketball Hall of Fame. Big Shot might be joining Ben Wallace and the other Pistons greats in the Hall of Fame. 
John, Chauncey Billups has spoken on this before, telling TMZ Sports he belongs in the Hall of Fame. He's a five-time All-Star, Finals MVP, three-time All-NBA, two-time All-Defense, and one of the most clutch players in history. I do believe he'll get in because in terms of players, this to me seems like a pretty weak Hall of Fame class. And he does have a better resume than the guys that are – he does have a better re- resume than guys that are already in the Hall of Fame. I mean, I didn't even know Maurice Cheeks was in the Hall of Fame. And he does have an impressive resume, but I would still take Chauncey's resume over Maurice Cheeks. And even when I look at, like, Vince Carter and I compare the two, I know Vince Carter has all the highlights. He was an eight-time All-Star. He, I think he only made two All-NBA teams. He had that great playoff duel with Allen Iverson – back in like I think 2001 but man he did all of that in like his first nine years of the NBA he did reach the 25,000 points he played for 22 years he had a career that expanded the 90s the 2000s the 2010s and even had some games in the 2020s like it was a fantastic for career for Vince Carter but I think a guy but Chauncey Billups is more accomplished and has done more on his NBA resume and I think he deserves a shot more than Vince Carter does to be in the Hall of Fame. I think both of them will get in. But when I'm looking at like a Hall of Fame career, I think Chauncey Billups had more of a Hall of Fame career than Vince Carter, who was more of just like a highlight reel. You know, I mean, he could dunk all over you, but it just, there was a lot, in my opinion, with the way Vince Carter could play with how athletic he was with his abilities and what he could do on the floor. I personally feel like he left a lot of meat on the bones compared to a guy like Chauncey Blues who got every little bit out of his career. Thank you guys for listening to the three championship drive podcast. Do me a favor, go to Google, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe. After you subscribe, leave review, drop a rating, vulnerable polls, and more importantly, tell a Pistons fan.